Hi, I'm Villain Fury, and welcome to the video where we're discussing my top 15 favorite heroes, also known as the 15 heroes that I enjoy the most personally. It's the same thing. I'm not going to say I think these are the most 15, you know, most enjoyable heroes on average for everyone. It's my personal taste, but I thought that'd be interesting to talk about because I did a tier list recently, and that seems to have started off quite a bit of discussion about tier lists and, you know, there's all sorts of talk online. People have done responses to my videos, but something people seem interested in is not just, you know, power. And I agree, I don't think that's, you know, that important, but fun. And I think that's particularly subjective. You know, that's going to change per person, but still an interesting topic. It seems like some of you guys want to hear that. So hopefully this is interesting. I did a poll recently on what videos to do. This didn't win. Um, Aspect and Archetype Guides won, and also Villain Rankings was very close. But those videos are taking a lot longer to prepare. I am working on them. I want to give you guys the best possible videos uh, on those topics. And this video is, you know, I would hope is no less in quality, but it's certainly easier and quicker for me to make, and I've not uploaded for a while. So let's just get into it. At number 15, we have Shadowcat. Now, my top 15 really wanted to be a top 20. There are a lot of people vying for this, you know, final space. And my top 10 ended up becoming a top 15 because there are so many heroes I really like and I think they all deserve a mention. But Shadowcat just made the cut and I do really like her. So she's got this fun puzzle with her, you know, phased form. She has a form card that's always in play and she can be solid or phased. She wants to end the turn phased every turn to be able to defend and take no damage. And then it flips and she can spend uh, solid as a resource generator to, you know, pay for an attack. Then she can end up back in phase again in the next turn. So it's a really fun puzzle. And I've called her here the best extra form flipping character, which is a mouthful. But some characters have extra forms, you know, Spectrum, Ant-Man, not just a standard one hero, one alter ego. And I think Shadowcat has the best form flipping in that regard because it interacts with aspect cards. Any kind of attack aspect card can help her change form um, and defense cards. And I think that's really important and powerful. Um, it's just not powerful in terms of, you know, power power but powerful in terms of player choice and interactivity i love interacting you know in interesting ways with the cards and she also breaks all the rules which i think is really fun you know if she's in phase she doesn't take any damage which kind of means she can ignore amplify icons at least when she's being attacked when it comes to fording if she's phased she can ignore the patrol and you know crisis icons so you know she can bypass a lot of things that most characters can't and i think that adds a really interesting dimension to her game plan which i enjoy now i think she's most powerful in protection but i want to shout out playing shadow cat in aggression or justice i think both are very very viable and very very fun so yeah really like shadow cat we're off to a very strong start here Next up, we have Scarlet Witch, who is really, really interesting. And in some ways, I think Hexbolt, which is my favorite card for her, is one of the you know very best cards in all of Marvel Champions. I think Hexbolt is Marvel Champions. So what is Marvel Champions? Villain does random stuff. You have a random hand of cards every turn. You have to try and match up that hand of cards, you know, to solve the problem that, you know, the random, you know, villain problems have presented to you. So Hexbolt is kind of another layer of randomness. But you can manipulate it a bit like when you're given a hand of, you know, five cards. You can choose which ones you're going to play. Scarlet Witch can kind of nudge about what Hexbot is going to do. So it's kind of like, you know, a hand of cards within a hand of cards. You know, it's one card that's going to lead to three different options. You're not quite sure which. I think it's really fun. And the way she can manipulate it with her crest and her hero ability chaos control to, you know, play the odds, nudge things about. I really like that. It's a lot of really interesting interaction. We don't normally get to... You know, when we have a card that lets us have different options, either it's completely random normally, or we get to choose. But she can kind of influence it, but she doesn't get full control. And I think that's awesome. And she also messes with boost icons and runs off of those, which is super unique and not something else we get to interact with very often. And what I really like is, you know, I like dynamic turns. I like, you know, things which change. And a lot of the time, you know, you'll draw your hand of five cards in hero form and you'll be like, I don't know, I'm going to play this and this, you know, probably. Maybe the encounter card changes your plan a bit and you should always adapt to it. But for the most part, some characters kind of play themselves. You kind of know what's going to happen uh, before, you know, you even start playing the cards. But with Scarlet Witch, Hexbolt, one of her best cards, definitely recommend playing it at almost every single opportunity. Now, that's a two cost card, but if you pay for it with cards from your hand, you will start with five cards and, you know, also the card itself, you know, as well as the two costs, you're going to be three cards down. So it's a really heavy investment and it's not going to leave you tons of room to, you know, play cards outside of it and it draws you cards. But it does different things. It could thwart, it could damage, it could, you know, give you a status card. 
So if it thwarts, you might then think, you know, okay, I've handled the threat, now I'll spend the rest of my hand on damage. But if you don't get that thwarting, you're going to have to try and find that thwarting somewhere else if that's what you need. So your turn really, you know, halfway through with a hex bolt kind of changes and suddenly you have to adapt again. And I love things that push me to do that, just, you know, to make, make engaging decision making. So that's really, really fun for me. So Scarlet, which is always, uh, you know, really enjoyable. Next up, we have Cyclops. Now, a lot of people weren't keen on Cyclops pre-release. A lot of the talk I was seeing is, you know, he won't be able to generate any, you know, resources. He'll be really poor, can't afford cards. He won't be able to deal with minions very well. I think he's got loads of money and, you know, not tons. He's not in the highest bracket for resource generation or anything like that. You know, between priority target and just the way he can, you know, find tactics, you know, when he's alter ego and things like that. He can afford whatever he needs to, in my opinion. And he is really good at dealing with minions, which is something I was expecting before he was released. But, you know, there was definitely uh, a very vocal crowd, shall we say, that thought otherwise. And he's turned out to be really good. And I would say really well balanced outside of some very specific leadership builds that, you know, interact with X-Men, where he's, you know, I would say exceptionally strong, but yeah, just a really fun character with loads of variety, you know, taking allies from different aspects, you know, X-Men allies, really, really fun. And yeah, some of the time it's, you know, you're taking the best ones from every aspect in a lot of the decks, but there's still a lot of room for customization. I don't think, you know, any of my published Cyclops decks use the exact same set of allies, which I think is a testament to the variety that that can bring. And I love how interactive his kit is. You know, I'm using the word interaction or interactive a lot here, but, you know, I can play his forwarding event to get a tactic uh, upgrade. I can then put that upgrade, you know, onto um, the villain. And now all my allies are doing more damage. So by playing a forwarding event, I've got a means to make my allies do more damage. I think that's amazing. And you know, he's got lots of different you know, interactions like that. He's got different ways he can find cards. You know, even Phoenix can find any of his own cards. Um, Cerebro, he's pretty good with, you know. So he's got a lot of ways to grab cards that you need, but they are limited. It's not like he can grab any card he needs at any time. So I think you still get a lot of the fun randomness of card games, you know, without, you know, just having absolute control. But you're still getting a lot of control still, so he feels really good. And I think the tactical side of him, you know, shines really, really well. Adam Warlock is up next, and I don't think a lot of people like Adam, but I really like Adam. I think he has some incredible variety. And people will say, you know, oh, you can only have one of each card, so, you know, you can't combo things as well. You can't, you know, rely on these cards. And that's true. I think he encourages, you know, really demands more broad strokes deck building. You can't, you know, pick out two cards and think, I can't wait to use these together because he might not draw them in the same hand at any point throughout the game with only one copy of each. You know, that's very low odds. And he's got ways to grab cards he needs with quantum magic, but that's adding an extra cost on. So, you know, it's not really desirable. So there's definitely, you have to be cautious. It's more like, in my opinion, if you want to build into attacks, if you have something that keys off attacks, maybe fluid motion, you just take, you know, some of the best attacks from every aspect and put those into his deck. I think that works really well. He also works well in that regard with things like allies, where you can already only take one of each anyway. He can take a lot of the best allies from every aspect, a little bit like Cyclops, but he's not restricted to X-Men, although you can focus on one trait, you know, Guardian being the obvious one, and you can, you can do that. He's really, really good. He has tons of actually really good builds. There's one that's very popular. I think it's almost, you know, killed a lot of conversation around Adam Warlock decks, but I think that is really the tip of the iceberg, and there's so much more out there. And I really love that, you know, because he's got so many different cards, one of each, you know, in his deck, every hand of cards you draw looks very different. You're not just playing the same things over and over again. You have to really adapt and look at your hand. And I think you can play like the same deck 10 times with him, and you'll get 10 very different experiences, which I think is really, really cool. And the other thing I do like is Battle Mage. Now, yeah, some of these are more desirable than others, and it will depend on what you draw in your hand. But always think, hmm, which card am I going to sacrifice for Battle Mage? That's normally a really interesting choice. Even if there's one I specifically, you know, particularly want, I'm not always going to have that in hand, so it's always engaging, and I'm always having to think about it. So really a lot of fun with Adam. Then we've got Colossus, who I was not expecting to like. You know, pre-release, I was thinking, I wasn't sure how strong he's going to be. He kind of looked about, you know, middle. He's got some really strong points, but some really big weaknesses. But I was thinking, oh, he's a big heavy bruiser. And I think I personally like a bit more thinky, a bit more, you know, technical characters. And I thought Colossus looked, you know, just like a big bruiser. He's going to be fun to, you know, slug some punches with, but maybe not my thing overall. Turns out, here's some of the most engaging decision making on all of Marvel Champions. Spending toughs is a big deal because they are, you know, a big, you know, they are strong. So losing a tough is a big deal. And every time you spend a tough, you know, if you run out of toughs, 
you get stuck and you can't use most of his you know signature cards so he already has a you know a big decision to make am i going to spend this tough am i going to be able to keep up enough toughs to keep using my events you know when do i flip because you know when you go ultra ego and back to hero form you get a tough you know and how do i manage that with that low forwarding you know and even his opening you know what hands you know what cards do you play from your opening hand with you know things like uh, organic steel i think a lot of people just play that by default I don't play organic steel a lot of the time, but I don't not play it. It's really dependent on, you know, the scenario, what else I have in my hand. And it's really interesting. I also think he's a lot like Groot and Hulk, but improved in both counts. You know, I can draw comparisons between Hulk smash and made of rage. You know, everything Colossus does makes a big impact. It feels good. It feels kind of like Hulk smashing stuff, but then like Groot, Groot spends growth counters, but he can also be, you know, defended, you know, take less damage because of his growth counters. And that's a bit like Colossus with his Tufts. He can let an attack hit him, no big deal. But then he's, you know, used up a resource that he otherwise can spend on, you know, events or, you know, things like that. So I think there are some similarities there as well. And I think Colossus does, you know, everything a little bit better in terms of power and fun than Hulk and Groot. I do think he's quite often misunderstood. I think a lot of people, you know, he comes with his protection pre-con, but the pre-con is really bad, guys. And... I personally think, at least in solo play, that just as suits him really, really well because it lets him go Ultra Ego more safely. And in Ultra Ego, you get two more hand size and you get to get a tough on the way back down. So you always have a tough for your events and you always have more, you know, every other turn, you have more cards to play with. So I think that's really, really powerful. So if you're playing Colossus and you're not having a good time, but you're not flipping very much, flip with Colossus and it will make all the difference. It's such a huge, huge benefit. Next up, we have Black Panther. And, you know, this is a fun list. And I can talk about liking technical characters all I like. But, you know, Black Panther is the first character I ever played in this game. He has the nostalgia for me. That's a very personal thing. But I really enjoyed him, you know. My buddies, you know, saying, you know, what hero do you want to play first? He's showing me these few heroes. And I'm like, what does Black Panther do? And what he does is you play his upgrades and then you use events to trigger them and kind of, you know, detonate the effects and i think that is really really cool and i still enjoy that wakanda forever is still one of my favorite cards in all of marvel champions you know along with you know i've mentioned hexbolt these two cards are some of my favorites and i also think he's you know he's from the core set and i'm calling this retro vibes which i slightly hate myself for but i think it's a kind of a good term for you know he doesn't do things you know generically it's not like he's got you know free attack events free forwarding events you know couple of defense events a resource generator off he goes you know he doesn't have the standard you know kit that not every hero has that and most heroes do have a good twist on that but you know these days i've seen most modern heroes will you know fit that criteria black panther doesn't have a single attack or forwarding event in his entire hero kit he has wakanda forever which can lead to attacks and forwarding but it's not you know naturally there you have to build something up else you know put another upgrade in play for them to be able to do that so he just does things differently and he really is very much a classic core set hero and then he's got that fun sequencing and he doesn't have the most intricate sequencing you know i could compare him to newer heroes but he still has sequencing you have to put your thought into and what i mean by sequencing is doing things in the right order which specifically here really means after you play Wakanda forever, using your upgrades in the most beneficial order. Usually that means trying to finish off the enemies in the right, you know, kind of way to not miss any excess damage, you know, pop toughs with some smaller hits, things like that. And it's still engaging. It's still good even to this day. So I still will like that. At number nine, we have Nebula. And, you know, I've done kind of, you know, favorite lists before on, you know, just Discord, you know, places like that for fun. And she's made my top five before. But I think the problem is she's very focused on her signature kit. Not a lot interacts with that in the game. And that's not strictly true. There are a lot of cool interactions, but she's just been slipping down uh, gradually. Still really like Nebula though. Really, really unique. Now, yes, Black Widow flips and, you know, you could compare preparations to techniques. It's just kind of, you know, upgrade one use most of the time that you want to play with Alter Ego to draw cards with Alter Ego, then, you know, flip down and use them. Uh, most of the preparations are locked to being in hero form, uh, you know, to use them. And Nebula is when she's in hero form and starts her turn that the techniques go off. So there's definitely similarities there, but I think that's where it ends. Nebula's techniques are very much, you know, aggressive, you know, they're giving you some kind of output, they're affecting the board, whereas Black Widows are kind of stopping the board from being affected. They nullify effects, whereas Nebula is more aggressive and active, and I really enjoy that. She makes you think ahead, you know, no matter what's happening, 
you know, if you flip down and you're ending your turn in hero form, you know your techniques are going off next turn. So you're having to kind of plan for that, which I really like. And these techniques have a lot of passive bonuses, which are really good, which I think a lot of people overlook or don't, you know, play into. You can get boosted stats, take less damage, overkill on every attack. You know, there's some really cool stuff there. And if you play a technique, uh, while you're starting the turn in hero form before you flip down, you can benefit from it that turn, then go ultra ego. Next turn, flip down to hero form, use it again. And then finally, it's the next turn where it actually goes off. So you can get those passive benefits of quite a while, even kind of longer in multiplayer, where you can maybe play an event on someone else's turn that will now benefit from having that overkill or something, um, because it hasn't rolled around to your turn yet. So your techniques haven't, you know, triggered the special effects yet. So big fan of Nebula. Then we have Ant-Man. Ant-Man is really, really good. I'm calling him the ultimate normal hero. How normal you consider him is, you know, debatable. He's a flipping hero, you know, one of the first, you know, with an extra, maybe he was the first, with an extra form, not just, you know, hero and alter ego. He has hero, alter ego, and a hero form. He's got two hero forms. But I don't think he's, you know, a master of basic attacking, although it's very, very good. I don't think he's a master of events, although his events are good, you know, Giant Stomp especially, you know. I don't think he's the, you know, tankiest, most resilient hero, although he can tank a lot of damage. He's kind of a good all-round in many respects. I think his forwarding is maybe not so good in the big multiplayer games. He can still do it fine, you know, still can kind of everyone. But, you know, definitely one and two player. He can kind of do whatever he needs to, whatever he wants. Very well-rounded and gives you very much what I feel like is a classic Marvel Champions experience without pushing anything too crazy, but just doing everything really well and really fun. And I think that's one of the reasons why I really like him in solo play. So I predominantly play in, I'd say two player. I do play one player a lot, but two players might preferred. And a lot of the characters here I'm talking about under the context of two player. So Nebula, I think I like a little bit less in solo play. Whereas Ant-Man stays really strong to me in solo play. For solo play, he probably moves up a couple of spaces for me. So I thought that was interesting to, you know, talk about and consider with him. He's just kind of, you know, kind of an all-rounder when it comes to solo play. And he has one forwarding event. He pings a threat when he goes small. So, and, you know, he can get that two forwarding in tiny form which is really, really fun. And yeah, just having a huge card is awesome. I just want to point out, you know, we have Wasp who also has a bigger card and we have Angel coming out very soon, you know, with his Archangel form. But Ant-Man, when you flip up to giant form, it deals with damage. That is so satisfying. That really makes you feel like you've, you know, changed and made an impact. And yes, when you go small, you fought as well. Also fun, but yeah, just going huge and dealing damage. I think that's a really fun combination and really satisfying. And then we have Rogue, and I think people would be surprised to see Rogue. I think they're probably surprised to see Adam Warlock and Nebula. I think along with Adam Warlock, Rogue is the most misunderstood character in all of Marvel Champions, by far, you know. I think people see that she can steal traits, and oh, I'm going to build some really funky builds, and I'm going to you know, have this crazy plan, and I think it's easy to go too crazy. I think you want to keep it simple, but you don't even have to build into traits at all for her to still be very unique and have tons of varied builds that most heroes couldn't even dream of running. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that. I, I kind of feel like I need a whole video to talk about Rogue, but here's the thing. People think, oh, she's only good in multiplayer. No. You can, you know, yeah, okay, she can't put touch on another identity to get Star Wars and Solo, but her own cards are perfectly good. You know, there are over 40 characters who only play their own cards in solo play. That's not a big deal. I don't think that's a downside that she cannot play cards from other heroes, you know, in solo play, because that's just how the game works. Um, what she can do with Superpower Adaptation, which is by far my favorite card from hers, is she can grab whatever kind of event she needs when she needs it. And there are limitations. You need, you know, you need the right ally to grab the right card, but if you build for it, which I think you need to, you can grab it when you need it. And she also has 13 signature uh, cards that are events. So she almost has, you know, enough events already. You need to build in resource generation. You know, if you think, oh, I can't afford her events and stuff, you've not built in enough resource generation or focused on getting it out most of the time because she can run really smoothly with things like X-Gene, um, Deft Focus, Weapon X, all these one cost ways to get more cards and resources going. Really, really strong stuff here. I didn't expect to put Rogue in my top seven, but I'm really glad that I have. You know, now that I look at my overall list, which I'll show you guys at the end, I wouldn't move her. You know, if anything, I want to move her up. I really like Rogue and I, I will die on the hill that she is good in terms of power, but also fun. And yeah, maybe we'll talk more about her in her own video sometime. Up next, we have Cable and I really like Cable. Cable has surprised me. Cable is the hero from Next Evolution that I was looking forward to 
the least. He was the Colossus of Next Evolution, uh, that whole wave for me. And like Colossus, he's made it onto my top 15. Uh, I didn't expect this, but he actually has a ton of really engaging decision making. You know, you have that decision at the start of the game. What player side scheme am I going to grab and, you know, set out in play? Which gets crazy in multiplayer. But even in solo, there are a lot of decisions to be made. And I actually think he has a lot more difficulty than most people uh, recognize. I think he is... You know, definitely, I would say in maybe the top 20%, maybe top 30%, I don't know the numbers, uh, hardest characters to play in Marvel Champions. I just don't think that is talked about because Domino, who came out at the same time, is absolutely crazy and has so, so many opportunities. She's easily, in my opinion, the most complex hero in Marvel Champions, but Cable, I think, has a lot of complexity too. And I just love the tension between, do I want to try and clear these side schemes or do I need to deal with the other things the villain is doing or even just push forward and try and end the game? He's always got different priorities, you know, begging for his attention and I think that means you as a player get to make some tough but impactful and meaningful choices it plays a bit different to a lot of heroes I think some people don't gel with that but for me it's kind of perfect I really really enjoy that you know so and I love how his cards get powered up as you go it's not a case of I need to play these upgrades and get a bigger board they respond to your objective of player side schemes which is really unique and then we have Nova, who in many ways I feel like is made for me, you know, as a deck builder. He's got so, so many options, especially if you lean out of some of the most common options for him. He still has a lot of really, really good options, which, you know, even if you're in multiplayer and maybe not going for dive bomb, he can still do exceptionally well. So he's got all these cool cards and things going on. And I love the decision making because you're trying to match up his helmet to get as many resources out of it as you can. You have a lot of interesting sequencing, which order you, you know, ready Nova to get your helmet ready again, which generates the resource. Unleash Nova Force is a, an amazing card. You know, talking of favorite cards, you know, we've had Wakanda Forever, Hexbolt. I think Unleash Nova Force is up there for me, probably a little bit below those ones, but still very, very good because you get to do so much with it, especially in multiplayer when there are more things to hit. You know, you can ready up um, so many times and get so much going on. So have some, yeah, maybe a little bit long term sometimes, but you know, they can be really fun. So huge, huge fan of Nova. Again, another champion here with Miss Marvel. Miss Marvel was honestly probably my favorite hero at one point in the game. And she's staying strong though all these years later. What I love most about Miss Marvel are the Shrink and Embiggen cards. I've cheated here. She has two cards uh, that are my favorite, but they're basically, you know, two sides of the same coin. One of them, Shrink, kind of empowers your forwarding events to fort for two more, and Embiggen makes your attacks deal two more. And what the coolest thing about this is it interacts with aspect cards and some aspect cards target multiple enemies or multiple schemes. Now you get to kind of duplicate the bonuses from Shrink and Embiggen, but I can also, you know, Embiggen into the fray. And even though the damage maybe isn't necessary, it's more excess damage, which is actually giving me more forwarding. So she makes old cards or, you know, existing cards different. She changes them up a little bit like Gambit, you know, he can have, you know, spend counters to increase attacks, uh, the value of attacks. So I really, really like that mechanic. I would spoil that Gambit did not make this list, but he was probably, you know, 16th or 17th for me. He's really high up there. I love this. But for me, Miss Marvel is my favorite way of doing it. Um, I just love the decision making you also get from her hero ability. You know, what am I going to bounce back? Do I use it again? Is it going to be a resource? And I just find that so much fun. And then we have Spider-Woman. I've already had Adam on here, Cyclops, Cable. You might be getting the impression that I like characters that can take from multiple aspects and Spider-Woman does that the best. You know, most characters have four aspects and you have to choose one and you know, a lot of the time, one or two of them might not be as good for them or you, you know, won't play as much. Spider-Woman can take two aspects at a time and they all combo it so well. There is not one combination I don't like. Aggression and justice, great. Aggression and leadership, great. Aggression and protection, also great. There is no, you know, order I can put those aspects in that I won't enjoy it. And she has so much synergy going on with all of them because they all synergize with each other in interesting ways. You know, aggression and protection both have interesting uh, stuff about minions or getting attacked. You know, leadership and justice, you know, maybe a little more threat removal heavy aspects and you know, you can start to empower justice allies with leadership cards, or you can, you know, take shield cards from both aspects. But then aggression and leadership, you can bring boot camp and, you know, comparable those cool aggression allies. The possibilities are endless, you know, protection to heal up your uh, leadership allies, justice and protection, where you can really, really lock down, you know, the two loss conditions to threaten taking damage, or she herself has a lot of damage already in her kit, you know, with the way she can ready up and, you know, Venom Blast. 
really really cool character i'm barely scraping the surface and the combos i've talked about are honestly pretty basic you can go really deep with these really unique things and it's amazing so the variety she brings and unique combos are second to none and i will say you know she's the only character here well i haven't actually picked a favorite card so we've gone from miss marvel where i cheated and picked two to spider woman you know spider woman i haven't picked one for and that is because i think her signature cards are very bland but i think that's on purpose and i think that's kind of a good thing they're just kind of you know the attack one deals damage the threat remover one i can i can split it but it's pretty simple you know pheromones i don't know why that's a leadership card but it stuns and confuses it's all straightforward stuff right it's nothing that's getting me excited but the thing is it's kind of so generic and bland that it works with any kind of deck so you can take these really crazy aspect combos and her signature cards kind of just slot in to supplement it and you know they're quite so powerful you kind of driven to play them quite a bit which maybe isn't such an upside but you can kind of just make those signature cards work with any kind of deck so that gives her so much deck building freedom because she has such a unique deck building hook with those multiple aspects and i barely even talked about superhuman agility i've sort of hinted that you know she's good at ready and she can get a lot of attack but that is such an engaging way to try and play as many different you know aspect cards as you can in one turn to boost your stats that's an engaging mini game all on its own spider woman is fantastic but there are two characters which are even, you know, more fun than Spider-Woman, in my opinion. Storm is awesome. Storm affects the whole board with her weather supports. She can affect the whole board in four different ways from turn one. That is incredible. It doesn't get more interactive than that. And having a decision that affects every single character in play, especially in like four player or anything, but even in solo play, you know, she's a very high skill cap character because all that interactivity means you have to make some very careful decisions. And there are some, you know, good rules of thumb to make things simpler. You know, if you're in multiplayer, take an action on someone else's turn to change your weather to something that might always be detrimental for the group, you know, that kind of thing. But she just interacts so much that leads to so much amazing decision making. But her weather supports are also really dynamic. So what I mean by that is, if I go into Thunderstorm this turn, next turn, I cannot go into it again. I will start my turn in it, but I cannot ping that two damage. I have to change to a different form. And I probably want to, even if I like the plus one attack bonus, because my cape is going to ready me up or something like that. So one door closes, another opens every time she changes form. And yeah, Weather Goddess is, you know, a factor and can make that easier. And that's such a fun card anyway. She just has all these things going on that I just really, really like Storm. It's awesome. It's amazing. And if you've been following my favorite aspects, I haven't talked about it all the time. She's only the second character to have protection as one of them. Some characters I prefer in protection, you know, Rocket Raccoon with uh, Repurpose is one of my favorite decks. Hasn't made this list, unfortunately, but you know, there are characters I really actually prefer in protection, but it's not my favorite aspect. It's more of kind of a secondary pick for me a lot of the time. So not many characters that I like it with. But what I like with Storm is, you know, she can uh, get a lot of attack stat with that, you know, plus one attack from Thunderstorm really early on, so ready is a good with her. But, you know, I can play multiple man, get free allies very quickly, and they will have that boosted attack stat. And I just think it works with her surprisingly well. But normally, maybe leadership's a bit more powerful, but... I also really like aggression. You know, if I'm in multiplayer, I think aggression is my favorite, especially combined with boot camp, because you can get allies to absurd levels of attack. It just feels stupid once you've got it set up, and I kind of love that. So big, big fan of Storm. And then finally, Star Lord. If you know anything about me, I think I've mentioned this in videos with, you know, Nelson. I've mentioned it on Discord. I've mentioned it on Reddit. Star Lord is my favorite character. I love Star Lord. He is just crazy. You know, he's always changing things up. The game is always dynamic. He's always something going on. This is never really talked about, but I think Star-Lord is the richest hero in Marvel Champions. What do I mean by that? I mean, he can basically generate or, you know, get a discount for free resources every single turn with his hero ability. That is outrageous. That is crazy. Now, it comes with a consequence. So it's money with a catch. It's a loan. Yeah, I'll borrow those free resources, but oh, then I've got to pay because of this encounter card. Um, so it's not, you know, just like he can pay for everything, you know, for free. But nonetheless, he is paying for a lot more than most characters or has at least the potential to if you choose to use it. And what that really means to me is when you play Star-Lord, you get more Marvel Champions than with any other character. You're paying for more cards than any other character really can, but you have more encounter cards to deal with than any other character. More things are going on in a Star-Lord game than most other characters, even if you maybe have less buttons to press than, you know, a character that's built up a huge board of tiny upgrades. But in terms of, you know, what you could pay for and what the villain is doing, you, there is a lot. And I think that's really cool. And, you know, I say here, he's an adrenaline-fueled thriller. 
yeah, there's so much risk and the key is to mitigate it. I don't think you should just always take an extra encounter card, always go for that risk. There is definitely levels of managing it. And I think he's one of the highest skill cap characters in the game. I think even Colossus I'd put in that company. Um, Domino, who almost made it into this list, you know, Gambit, Domino, probably my 16th and 17th favorite character if I was to expand this list a little bit, but this has already been quite a long video. You know, he's got so many great choices. Am I going to get that discount of free? Can I deal with that encounter card? You know, what am I going to do? Um, so much variety. He brings new context to every ally he brings because he makes them all guardians. So now every ally in the game can potentially be a guardian and, you know, benefit from the guardian toys and upgrades and blaze of glory things like that but i love him in every aspect i think he's a bit like cyclops leadership seems like the obvious fit for him and yeah honestly it, it is and it's their best aspects in terms of power but he can be really effective and fun in every aspect and i think that's underrated even protection you know a lot of builds are all about using allies and with his low defense and kind of low hp you know he wants to block with allies quite a lot but in protection, you can focus on healing up those allies. It's a really fun kind of different play style. He's also got a lot of readies with daring escape. You can run repurpose. You can do all sorts, you know, with him really anywhere. And, you know, I like him in justice. You can do things with X-Men, give them mission training, combine with leader of the guardians. And then you've got, you know, four threat removal on, you know, your allies each use, which is crazy. You can put, you know, I really like him in shield. Shield is kind of a slow build, um, kind of archetype kind of thing. But Star Lord can, you know, he's got all that money I've been talking about. He can set Shield up quite quickly. And in a solo perspective, you can use Global Logistics to look at the encounter deck, and then you can make an educated decision on whether you want to use your, you know, hero ability to, you know, discount a card by free but get an encounter card because you know what actually could go wrong. You know, the ability is called what could go wrong. Global Logistics tells you what could go wrong. Um, I just love that interaction, you know, and I could talk about, you know, all the aspects a lot more. But Stello just has so much variety. He interacts with, you know, all the allies and everything. And even the encounter deck, you know, it's just so much going on. I'm a huge fan of him. And, you know, I got to talk about my favorite card, Sliding Shot. The amount of burst damage Star Lord can manifest is just legendary. I really enjoy it. Um, I don't really like to play him in Rush if you can't tell by the builders I've been talking about, but you can play him in Rush and that is still exceptionally fun. One of the best Rush characters in the game. And there you have it. Star-Lord is my number one pick. Very closely followed by Storm and not closely followed, but, you know, very strongly followed by, you know, Spider-Woman and Miss Marvel and Nova. And I love all of these characters. I, w I wasn't going to name that many, but I really like the heroes in this game. The designers have done a great job. And that brings us to the end of my top 15 favorite heroes. The heroes I enjoy the most personally. What do you guys think? Let me know what your favorites are in the comments. Let me know what kind of content you'd like to see. Any feedback, anything and everything, always welcome. I appreciate you guys, you know, every time you tune in. And if you've made it this far, I've got a very special announcement for you. Me and Nelson, and I assume everyone here knows Nelson, but he's a very big uh, content creator for Marvel Champions. We're doing a podcast together. It's called Shadow of the Cast, and it is coming out very soon, I think next week, hopefully on Monday, but you know, knock on wood, if it's not there on Monday, something's happened. But we've already recorded it. We recorded it yesterday and it was a ton of fun. So if you guys want to tune into that, we'll be posting it here on YouTube. It'll also be everywhere you find podcasts. If you have any questions you'd like us to answer, please go ahead and, you know, you can comment here, comment on that video. Any way you can contact me, please go ahead. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye.